Christchurch, Church, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us online. Let's worship together this morning. We praise you today, Lord. God, we know that when we praise, Father, we join in with all creation, God, singing your praise, God, declaring your glory. And I pray, Father, God, we would worship in spirit and in truth today, Jesus. God, we lay our lives before you in worship. May it be a sweet sound to your ear today, Jesus. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. 
your hidden glory in creation and I'll be filled in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. Why well, could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus.
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus, we love your name, Lord. Thank you, God, that in your name there's victory, there's power, there's freedom. We worship you today, Jesus. We lift your name up and we declare you the King of kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Oh, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I hope you guys enjoy the service. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us online for our online service and uh, we're so excited for the service ahead of us. We hope you guys are incredibly well and um, we are carrying on with the series that we kicked off last Sunday. Tom spoke so well and the, the series is called The Holy Bible and um, what a great uh, title. You know, we try to be creative sometimes but that's just loud and proud and we're going to be talking about the Bible in this series and uh, I'm going to be picking up week two um, of this series and uh, excited for the message ahead of us but um, I thought maybe just to kick off today, why don't we just pray and open up this message and then we'll get uh, stuck into it. Uh, Father God, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to just look at your word, Father God. Um, let your, your word minister to us, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you would, you would speak through uh, me this morning, Father. I pray, God, that your voice would be heard and that, uh, Lord, we would learn something about your word, something that is so precious and so vital to us in, in our lives, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your word today, and we pray that it would, it would, it would really impact us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, so the, the title of my message today is What the Bible is All About. So we're going to be looking at what the Bible is all about. And um, I wanted to start off with a scripture today uh, that is from Colossians 3.16, and it's, it's a r real short uh, kind of scripture, and it says this, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And if, if, that, if there was a theme for, uh, for today's message, that's what it would be about, that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly. And to start off, I just wanted to use an analogy that I've seen uh, before, maybe you've seen this before as well, but um, I think it, it just illustrates so well um, what we're talking about today. Uh, uh, so I've got a, a it's not a teacup, but it's a see-through cup, and you'll see why in a second. But I've got some hot water here, some boiling water, and I've got a tea bag. And I don't know if any of you are tea drinkers. We're not really uh, tea drinkers at our church. Um, we're more into coffee, but uh, it's not going to, coffee's not going to work for the illustration today. But um, when we pop a tea bag into this hot water, uh, watch what happens. So initially the water, you know, the, the tea bag goes in, you can really start to see change color. Now, I don't think none of you would, would probably consider this tea um, at this point, but as time goes on, um, you know, as we, if I can try to pick this up, you know, if we dip it a little bit more, the, the tea kind of soaks in and the water starts actually changing color and obviously changing flavor. And at some point it becomes, um, it becomes tea. And as I leave it, as I preach, you'll see that this tea will get stronger. I don't know if you, we've got any weak tea drinkers uh, in the house uh, this morning watching online, but some people love their tea almost like it's basically milk. Um, but other people like a strong cup of tea in the morning. Um, but as I, as I carry on preaching, this is going to get stronger and stronger. And what's going to, it's going to get to the point where um, it actually becomes tea. And, um, it's kind of similar with the Word of God. You know, a lot of us as Christians, through, throughout our, our Christian walk, we, we kind of often just dabble in the Word of God. We, we, we kind of just let the Word of God, we, we dip it in, you know, into our lives. Maybe it's once a day, maybe it's, I don't know, once a week. Maybe you haven't read your Bible in a while, that's totally okay. But that's kind of how we treat the Word of God. And, and, and I think the goal for us is to, to um, really step up our um, engagement with the Word of God to the point where on a regular basis, like this tea bag, we are actually just dipping um, the Word of God into our lives um, on a regular basis to the point like this, this water becomes tea to the point where we actually become like the Word of God. And I think that, the, the, that illustration just kind of um, echoes that scripture, that, that the Word of God would dwell in us richly, that we would, um, you know, the, Tom mentioned last week that there's, there's, on average, I think about two and a half Bibles 
I don't know where the, the half of that one went, but there's on average two and a half Bibles in, in every single home, which is actually quite incredible. Um, and uh, a lot of those Bibles, uh, I'm afraid to say, would probably kind of be on the, on the shelf, maybe gathering dust. I know in my, in, my, uh, in my personal capacity, I have about four or five Bibles. Not all of them are being used. Um, but that we, you know, as, as Christians, we would move from a, from a place um, of letting the Word of God, you know, kind of just sit on a shelf to, to actually letting it be a, a, an essential part of our lives, something that we, we, we go to on a daily basis. We, we get our wisdom, we get our, our source of life, from this word, and there's a scripture uh, from uh, 2 Timothy, um, th- also 3.16, and it's almost like all good scriptures are uh, 3.16, um, but it, it says this, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture is God breathed. And so when we start to have that perspective um, on the Bible, that it's not this old book on a shelf, but it's actually living and breathing, and it's actually from the, the mouth of God Himself, that's when we start to change our, our, our perspective on the Bible and, and hopefully our relationship with the Bible. And I think, you know, if we had if we had to classify our relationship with the Bible, I think a lot of us date the Bible. We, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's something that we, we, you know, we go on a few dates with the Bible, uh, you know, a couple times in the month, or maybe it's just on Sunday, you, you, you come to church and that's your, your relationship with the Bible. But I think for us as, as Open Scars, we want to be a church that is going, moving from dating the Bible to actually being devoted to the Bible. And there's a big difference that, that, that we would have a devotion to the Word of God on a daily basis. And so today, what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to give you I'm just going to give you three useful tools and kind of three useful handles or mechanisms that we can use to become devoted, more devoted to the, to, to the Word of God, that we would, um, you know, the goal that we, we would say this about ourselves, that the Word of God dwells in us as individuals richly. And so I'm going to give you three useful tools, and then I'm just going to wrap up at the end and talk about what the Bible is actually all about and why it's important. So the, the first, um, which is... Probably the most obvious one, um, but I think, you know, in, in light of the topic today, it's something that I need to mention, is that the, fir- the, first, um, the first tool is to actually get a Bible for yourself. And, and when I say that, you know, Tom spoke about this, this last Sunday, but that actually we would have a physical Bible. We would have an actual paper Bible that we would consider our own and that we would carry through this life. And it's awesome. I mean, if you look after it, it can last, you know, your, your whole lifetime. And obviously, we, we're so blessed in, um, you know, in today's uh, age where we have, the, you know, the digital Bible. We have the version Bible app. And I mean, that is so, uh, so incredible and so useful in our day-to-day lives. But actually having a physical Bible, there's something special special about it. Um, it's something that, that is like almost like a it's, a, it's a personal belonging, and it's something that you can um, kind of carry with you throughout your life. And so I, I want to encourage you, church, um, to really have your own physical Bible. And so I want to just help you, and this, this message is going to be super practical today, um, and I don't know, maybe you're, you're someone that is super spiritual, and you, you might have to really pay attention to the practical stuff. Other people love, you know, it's just like, how, like, I need some help, like, can I have some practical tips? So this message is for you today, but um, to, to practically help you, I, I want to just talk about a, a few things in regards to choosing a Bible. So in, in choosing a Bible, you know, there are a variety of different what we call translations, okay? So there's a variety of different tra- translations. And what I would say, you know, if it's like, well, there's so many nowadays, um, and sometimes like a variety is actually not a, it's not a good thing. Um, but there, there's, so, there's such a variety to choose from. Which one should I choose? And I think the answer is probably picking one that, that you resonate with most, Pick, picking one that you actually like the most. Pick that one and read it. And um, I'm going to run through just a, a couple different types of, of translations. But to, first, to, to just kind of say that uh, I think there's sometimes a, 
a misunderstanding in terms of how the Bible was actually translated that, um, you know, I think so, some of us think that, well, you know, it, maybe you think that like God is actually was born in England um, and that the original language was, was English. But actually the, the original uh, Bible, the, the, the first manuscripts were, were written in, 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 in Hebrew and Greek. So we have Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. And, and how our English translations came to be is that um, scholars, sat down with the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, and they translated from that. Okay, so, and I'll talk about some of those versions. And then from there, when, when new versions come out of, of the Bible, people don't actually translate then from the English versions and then make a new English version. They don't base it on the old English versions. They actually go back to the original um, manuscripts and, and, and to the original languages. And that's so important to understand because... Um, it, uh, I'll speak about some of the, the best versions and best translations, but um, you, when we read these translations, we can be confident that uh, that for the most part that these, these um, words that we are reading in English um, represent extremely well what the original languages were trying to say. And that's so, that's so important. That gives you confidence. And when you read it, you know that you're getting the full picture of, of what was originally written. And so in terms of translations, there's actually two groups that I'm going to look at, two kind of different uh, types of translations that I just want to look at quickly. And they're quite, um, it's quite intellectual, so maybe just have another sip of coffee and just lean a little bit uh, and concentrate. But the first type of translation is this. It's, it's called formal equivalency. So formal, formal equivalency, that's the type of translation. And basically what that type of translation is, is that it's a word-for-word translation. So um, some of the versions that you might know that are like that are the King James version. So that's like the um, the f- kind of the first English uh, translation, and that's like from 1611. So that's like full Shakespeare English, like these and thous and Schultz and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's quite hard to, to read uh, nowadays, but that's a word-for-word translation. Um, another version is the New King James version. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, the King James version, like his hip young cousin, um, and that's a little bit easier to, to, to read, but still a word-for-word translation. And then another one that is really popular, and I think is probably, you know, very well used today, is, is the ESV, the English Standard Version. So that's one that I use quite a lot. I like to read that, and, or, you know, especially if I'm preparing a message or something like that, I like to read that, that version. And what that tries to do is to try, it tries to take the Hebrew words, the meaning of those Hebrew words, and try to translate it in the best way that it can, word-for-word, into English. And so sometimes uh, it, it's very useful because it can often hit home the, the, the root meaning of, of a scripture, but then also sometimes it's quite hard to actually read because it's, it's old school English. Sometimes the sentence structures are a little bit like, you know, not the way we would uh, use it nowadays because um, the interesting thing is that obviously, um, you know, the, the words in the King James Version um, or the, the, the English Standard Version, the, the words actually haven't changed, but some of the meanings of those words have changed over time. And so sometimes it can take on a meaning, uh, the Scripture can take on a meaning that it wasn't necessarily intended to. So um, that's formal equivalency. And then the other type of, of um translation is functional equivalency. And so basically, if, if, if formal equivalency is like word for word, then functional equivalency is thought for thought. So what they, what the, the, these types of translations do is they try to take the thought, the whole verse or the whole um, sentence of a, a scripture in, in the original language, and they try to translate it into the, a, 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 an English version of that thought, if that makes sense. So some of those versions... Um, that you would know is is the New Living Translation, so that's quite a popular one nowadays. Um, the the Good News Bible I used to have in Sunday school that was my uh, version of the Bible that I got given is is the Good News Bible, and the, then obviously the most popular one nowadays, and and probably the one that you know we would probably recommend on the balance of everything is the New International Version, the NIV. So that's the yeah, that first came out in I think 1987, and it's 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 the most popular. Um, if, 
functional equivalency translation. And the, the nice thing about these uh, versions is that they're quite easy to read. So they're not, um, they're not like simple English, but they just make a, a little bit more sense. And um, the, actually, the NIV is actually almost like a hybrid between the two. And I think that's why it's probably most, most popular is that it's, it's, it, it tries to get the balance of a word-for-word -word translation and a thought-for-thought -thought translation. So um, th that's the functional equivalency versions. And, um, uh, you know, again, I would say pick pick one that you would say this is my personal Bible, this is my home Bible, this is the one that I read every single day, and it's actually quite cool because what starts to happen is if you read the same the same version um, most of the time, obviously you can jump across and even with the Bible app, that's quite nice. You can jump between versions and really get a cool um, picture of what the scripture is trying to say. But if you read the same version often enough, what starts to happen is you start to actually remember it in that version. So, you know, a good example is like, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, uh, you know, that scripture, you actually know it in a certain version. And it's quite cool because you're able to, um, you know, really bring to mind those, um, those scriptures in those versions, and it's helpful to actually apply in your everyday life. So I would I would encourage you, um, you, you guys, that that to 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 pick a pick a version and just stick with it. Stick with it. If it's something that you feel like you're this, I can really grab onto this version, then then do that and 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 make it your own Bible. And then the last category of of Bible that I just want to touch on as well, which wouldn't necessarily be. Uh, categorized as a translation, it's actually a paraphrase, okay? So obviously the most famous and popular one that you would know is the message um, version. So the message Bible um, written by Eugene Peterson. Um, and, you know, that's been around for, I think, for the last like 20 years now. But um, that is a paraphrase. And the interesting thing about the, the, the message uh, Bible and other you know versions like it, the, the paraphrased versions is that they never they never actually intended to be a word for word translation. Some some of us you know we would pick up the message and we think that it's a word for word translation, but it's actually a paraphrase. And the interesting thing about a paraphrase is that it it it, it kind of tries to. Um, capture the heart and the essence of the scripture, but often in a way that, that is um, modern and, and, and that you can understand um, in, you know, obviously in uh, contemporary English. And um, it, it, it kind of illuminates the scripture in a, in a, in a really interesting and different way. And, um, you know, often these Bibles, these, these paraphrased Bibles, they're Bibles that you can almost have alongside your your main Bible that you can read, and I know that I do that. Especially, actually, interestingly enough, in songwriting, that's what I do. So, you know, if we if Tom and I are writing a song, we'll often jump from the actual you know translation of you know Bible to a, a paraphrase that will just kind of make that scripture come to life in a little bit of a different way and give us a little bit more of a poetic uh, feel to it. And often those paraphrase scriptures of like very expressive, and um, they're really uh, awesome to capture the emotion of, of, of Scripture, which I really, really love. So I really encourage um, all of you to, to, to get a paraphrase. Um, you know, the message is, is obviously fantastic, but there are others um, that you, you can look up. A great example of this, I'll just read this to you, is Psalm 84, verse 10. It's pretty cool. It says this. So this is a famous Scripture. In the NIV, it says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Okay, so we know that there's a, been a song that's written about that. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Okay, famous scripture. In the message, this is what it says. It's pretty cool. It says, one day spent in your house, this beautiful place of worship beats thousands spent on Greek island beaches. So it's just kind of, you can kind of see in that, that, that verse. It's just, you know, it, there was no mention in the original, you know, text and language about Greek island beaches, but it's just to express the the, the emotion and the, the feeling behind those scriptures, you know, which I think is so beautiful. So I encourage you grab a grab a paraphrase as well as a translation. And you know, we are so blessed nowadays because. Um, in English, we actually have a whole lot of different translations that we can use and we can embrace. And, you know, uh, I heard that there are, that there's an incredible stat, that there are still 3,000 languages in the world that don't have a, a Bible in their language. They don't have a translation of the Bible. And, um, you know, we are, as English people, you know, English-speaking people, we are so blessed. And I think it's something that we need to kind of up our game on, you know, because I think, that, you know, there's a lot of nations that would, you know, they would do anything to have the Bible in a language that they can understand. And so, you know, pick a version, pick a translation, get a paraphrase if you like. And then this is the key. 
um, of this first, this first tool is to read it. Church, can I encourage you? Let's up our game in terms of, our, of reading our Bible. I know for me, it's, it, and I'm sure it's, it's similar to you, that you go through seasons where you read, you read a whole lot, you, you read a little bit. But can, can we just make a decision um, in terms of our devotion to read the Bible more? I know that that's what I want to do even through this series. You know, it's inspired me, as Tom was preaching last week, to, to, to really get more into the Word of God. And I'll never forget, I'll just tell you the story that when I was in, when I was 16, I was on a, on a youth alpha camp and um, I didn't really have like a personal Bible that I considered mine, you know, and, and one of my good friends uh, gave me this Bible um, and it, I can't remember what version it was, but I think it was the CEV version, um, which is the contemporary English version. And he gave this to me, you know, because I, I was so... Um, kind of captivated by the Word of God for the first time in a real way. And he gave me his personal Bible, and he said, I've got a new one at home. I'm going to give you this. And I'll never forget the, the, the feeling that I had. I, I sat that night, and, I, and, I, and no jokes, I read the Bible for about five hours from, from, from dinner time all the way through to like the middle of the night. I just read the Gospels. I just read page after page after page. And I'll never forget that what that did in my heart. And, and even as I was preparing this message, I, I felt like, geez, I need, to, I need to get back into that place. I need to get back into that place where the, the Word of God um, is just so captivating to me. So that's the first tool. And then the, the second tool, and this is kind of like almost like level two <laughs> of, of being a Christian. Level two is, is you can actually get a study Bible, which I, I've got here. So I'm just going to move my, my tea. Um, I've got a study Bible here, and it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a beast. It's a big boy. Um, so I don't carry it around e everywhere with me. Otherwise, I'd break my back. Um, but uh, there, there's so many awesome study Bibles. So this is the ESV study Bible. And what a study Bible is, and this is a cool thing, which, uh, you know, where, again, we're so blessed to have this resource, is that it, it, it actually has the whole Bible in it, but then it also has commentary. So it's, sometimes it's called a commentary Bible or Bible commentary. And, and it actually has um, a whole lot of, you know, theologians and scholars that are actually commenting on each verse, every single verse. They've, they've got a, a reference note that you can actually look up and see what that, that, that verse is saying. Um, you know, the, the, the study Bibles are so useful, especially if you, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you teach the Bible in any way, maybe you, um, you preach at schools or you, you know, you have your own home group or that kind of thing. And you, in a space where you're sharing the Word of God and actually in, in all in all spheres of life, we have an opportunity to do, to do that. In the study Bible, it's really cool because you can you can go and see the the social context of of that scripture, what was happening at that time, um, in, in in that part of the world, and really understand uh, the scripture in a deeper way. It, it cross references um, scriptures from from other places in the Bible, and you can kind of just get a, a real great picture of how the Bible is woven together and actually how miraculous it is. And we're going to look at that in a second. Um, but, but God and Bible Bi study Bible, they're quite expensive, but you'll have this for life. And I know it's, it's helped me so much in understanding um, the scripture in, in a deeper way. And sometimes as, as Christians, we like to decide <laughs> what the, what the scriptures actually mean. You know, we like to decide what the verses are actually saying, but sometimes it's, it's great to just have our perspective aligned with what the word of God is actually saying. So I encourage you get a study Bible. It's awesome. I love sitting with this. And especially if I'm pre preparing a message, it's got like, it's almost like a, you know, it's like a cheat code for, <laughs> for preachers because you get to just understand the Bible in a deeper way. So get a study Bible. And then the, the, the third um, tip and a tool or, or, or mechanism that we can use to um, let the Word of God dwell in us richly, and this is so important, church, is that I really encourage each one of us to be a part of a home group. So we have, um, we have a couple home groups that run across the city during the week. And, you know, it's a great space to connect with people, get to know people better, to have like a family, a community around. But another function of those groups is to actually get into the Word of God in a deeper way. And, you know, in every single night of home group, there's an opportunity to look at a scripture, even if it's just one verse. You know, at the moment, we're doing the freedom course, um, which is a, is a pretty in-depth course, looking at how we can become more and more free in our lives. And... Um, there, there's so much study that is actually going on in our groups at the moment of the Word of God. And you get to read the Word of God, look at it, make notes, 
debate, you know, discuss all of those different things about the Word of God. And you actually get to unpack um, the Bible in, in, a, in a really fascinating way that you actually couldn't by yourself. And so that's why our home groups are so important. That's one of the functions. So I encourage you, get in a home group and you'll see your understanding and your, your, your revelation and your, the depth at which you know the Word of God is just going to grow and grow if you become part of that, um, of, 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 of a home group. And then the, um, the, the way I want to end today, and, and I, I, you know, I was just kind of, I was captivated by the, the psalm that, that Tom shared last Sunday. That was Psalm 119. And, you know, that is the longest chapter in the longest book of the Bible. And it's just interesting that that chapter just happens to be about the Word of God. It happens to be about the Word of God. So I, I want to just, um, I, I just want to read a few um, verses from, from this, uh, this psalm, uh, kind of just to, to wrap up. Um, and and I, I'll just read it, at, at, you know, and, and it's, it's just kind of a few verses that I picked out. There's like 150 verses, I think, in that chapter. But this, listen to how, this is what amazed me, you know, as I was preparing for this. This is what amazed me is that the relationship that David has with the Word of God, the way he talks about the Bible. Never mind the fact that actually uh, when this is written, there's no New Testament. So he's, he's talking about the law. You know, he's talking about um, the first few books of the Bible. Um, he's talking about the, the, you know, the, the, the books and the, and the prophets. And, and, and what he says and the way he, his language with, when it comes to the Word of God is so incredible. And it says this, you know, he says stuff like this. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. So he's comparing, you know, the, the, the Bible, the law to someone that receives a, a whole lot of money. You know, that, that same joy. I mean, that's incredible. Like, I, I, honestly, I, like, there's moments where I feel that way. But, you know, I, I know that I can grow in that regard. He says, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I love that. I will not neglect your word. And church, how, how many Christians nowadays who, who would actually profess to say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, have kind of just neglected the word of God? And David says, I will not do that. Oh, how I love your, your law. I meditate on it day, all day long. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I mean, that's so challenging that the words of God would be sweeter on our lips than honey in our mouths. I mean, that's, that, that is so incredible. And I think for us, you know, I, I want this in my life. And, I, and, and honestly, I would say that I've got, I've got, I've got real space to improve in, that, in this regard, that I would have the same relationship that David had with the Word of God, that I would love it more than anything else. Love it more than, than, you know, than life itself. Love it, let it be sweeter than, than honey on my lips. I mean, it's just so, so incredible. And so to wrap up today, I just want to, I want to talk about how, you know, if we don't fully understand what the Bible is all about, like what is the purpose of it? What, you know, it's a long book. There's a lot of chapters, there's a lot of stories, a lot of different people, a lot of different characters. What is this thing all about? And sometimes even as you look at it, especially this, you know, three kilogram one, um, you, you, you would ins you, you almost, it seems quite intimidating. But what is it all about? You know, and, and just to show you a few like interesting Bible facts. And I think this is just so incredible. I just think this is amazing. It, it says this. So, so some, some, of the, some Bible facts is that it was written over a period of 1,600 years, okay? So it's not like someone sat down, you know, one day in a, in a few months, like, produced this, okay? This was written over 1,600 years, a long time. It was written in over a dozen countries. So a, a dozen different countries. That's where the Bible was written. It was written on three different continents and by 40 different people, Okay, in the Bible, there's 66 different books. Okay, it's not just one long storybook. It's 66 different books. Okay, it was written by a variety of, of different types of people, poets and prophets and farmers and kings and, and you know, prisoners and, and soldiers and uh, fishermen and tax collectors. And, you know, the list goes on. Uh, just a variety of different types of be people from different types of backgrounds. It was written in a, in a whole lot of different places and environments. It was written in caves and on ships. And it was, you know, written in, in prison. You know, Paul wrote a lot of his, his uh, letters in prison. 
Rome. Um, it, it was written in palaces and, and in deserts and just a variety of different uh, you know, circumstances. And I think the question then is well, how, and we're going to look at this, and uh, Tom's going to unpack this next week, uh, which is going to be a great message. I, I, I just know it. And, 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 and the, the question is, well, how over that period of time, all those different people in different places, how did the Bible end up telling the same story? Just ask yourself that question. How, how, how is it? Because, we, you know, we read it and we know it as one, you know, you know concise you know, Bible between two, you know, uh, you know, kind of with one, one bound book. That's how we know it. But how did the Bible, that is 66 different books, tell the same story? You read the Gospels, and those are, four, you know, written by four different people and from four different backgrounds, and it, they, they're slightly different in their perspective, but the story is the same. How did that happen? And I think the only answer that you can probably come to that makes sense is that the Bible, although it was written by 40 different people, the Bible has one author, and, and his name is God. The Bible has one author, and he's the one, God's the one that has put it together. And when you start to understand that, the Bible takes on a different weight. And as, as I started with that scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is God-breathed. This is not a human event. This is not the work of human beings. This is orchestrated and, and ordained and, and put together by God. And I think that is just, that is just so so remarkable, and it, and it gives me such confidence in this, that over that period of time, that God could still, through his people, tell the same story. And so in closing today, I want to I ask you, what do you think the Bible is all about? And very simply, I mean, there's so much that happens in, <laughs> in the Word of God, and, and there's so much to draw from it, but I think very simply what the Bible is about is I think it's that the Bible is about the, the, the story of how God started creation and started humanity with a perfect plan in paradise and how over time, you know, as human beings, we've messed it up and how he has made the perfect solution in Jesus to take us back to paradise. So it's almost like we started in paradise and, and if, you, if you know how the, 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 the story ends and what's coming, is that he's going to take us back into paradise, restore the plan that he had for us. That's what the Bible is about. It's about redemption. It's about the fact that God took, you know, flawed human being in their sin, took them and is restoring and has restored us to a place where we can live with him again. And man, what a beautiful story. And you might find yourself in a different place within that story right now in your lives, but we know how as Christians, we know how the story ends, and it ends with us being in paradise with God, living in community with God again, completely united, and I, and I love that, and you know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to know, you know, ultimately who the Bible's about, I would say that the answer is Jesus. I would say the answer is Jesus. And we're going to look at it in next week's message, but how the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, the whole Bible is telling the story of our Savior. How Jesus, who was the Word, and that the Word was with God and the Word was God and that the Word was in the beginning, that Jesus is the Word and He's existed for all all time and He will exist for infinity and beyond, He is, He is the Word, and that's what this Bible is about. And when you start to read it that way, it, it becomes so real, where it's not just words on a page, it's actually learning about a person, learning about a Savior. And church, I hope that encourages you today. I hope that really helps you um, in regard to the Bible, that there are, there are practical ways that will help us let the Word of God dwell in us richly, like this tea, where it's completely immersed to the point that we actually become like the Word. There are practical ways that we can get into that space, but ultimately, we need to know 
that this Bible is about our Savior, Jesus. And when we start to do that, we will start to fall in love with it because falling in love with the Word of God means falling in love with God Himself. So come on, let's pray today. Lord Jesus, we thank You for, we thank you for Your Word, Father God. Uh, I thank You, Lord, that it is not work of human hands. It, it, it is God-breathed. Father, that you breathe this, this Bible out, this, this Word of God, in order that we may know you better, in order that we may know the story of redemption. And even as we talk about redemption today, Father God, I pray that your Word would help us understand who we are in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that because of your word, we know how the story ends. And I pray, Father, that today we would fall in love with your word in a, in a, in a real, in a tangible way. Help us know that this is more than words on a page, that this, is, this book is about our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have an amazing rest of your week. And uh, if you can, join us in person for one of our services at St. John's at 10 a.m. We'd love to see you there. Um, We always have a great time and our services um, are really fun. Uh, I think a lot more fun than online. So come on and join us in person and we will see you guys soon. Take care.